The first thing I po point I wanted to make is that I expect to hear a lot today about the potential and uh, value of computation uh, for providing uh, integration and integrative understanding in biology. And I see, thank you. I see. Uh, uh, if I find it useful to. Uh, look at the ways that computation can be integrated in biology uh, and classify them into three broad classes. The first is informational knowledge integration, which I consider to be the domain of bioinformatics. The second is functional integration, putting together the pieces of networks and putting together functional subsystems within cells and physiological systems. Um, and that I consider to be a key goal of systems biology. And the third is structural integration across physical scales of biological organization from molecule to organism and population. Um, and that uh, is a field that is now known, um, particularly amongst 11 federal agencies, as multi-scale modeling. Obviously, in order to achieve a vision uh, as, um, as ambitious as the 3D virtual cell, we need all of these approaches. And my main message that I can tell you right now is that there are many uh, paradigms by which we can use these different fields and the numerous different approaches within them to achieve that goal. And that having developed these paradigms, tested them and validated them, shown them to be biologically useful, we can reuse them and that's why we need a community. There's enough room for everyone and a whole lot more people who haven't even been born yet to do this problem. And I wanted to try and use my time to show a couple of examples of these, one on structurally driven cell models of reaction diffusion processes, another one on using Markov models to bridge molecular to network models. Um, a second message I uh, would like to make is there's no particular reason to stop at the cell, and I'll show you a couple of examples of problems we've done on cardiac arrhythmias and whole heart mechanics that start at the molecular scale. The third message, if I have time, is that software engineering is important. Um, we have a, um, developed in our own software engineering some particular priorities, and uh, I hope I get time to briefly share those. And then finally, um, interdisciplinary training. We need the next generation of interdisciplinary training, inter interdisciplinary training. And um, I think of this less as a challenge than an enormous opportunity to attract who turn out to be the really best students, uh, graduate students and uh, trainees uh, uh, who, who are interested in life science today. Uh, so let me start with um, a structure-driven problem. This is uh, understanding the uh, fundamental basis of cardiac excitation contraction coupling, which is mediated by calcium and the, um, the fundamental uh, process or the unitary process of that uh, mechanism is called the calcium spark. It takes place at the, um, at the uh, very narrow 15 nanometer wide dyadic cleft between the extensions of the, um, the membrane at the T-tubuli um, and the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane that's the intracellular uh, calcium stores in the myocyte. And uh, Masa Hosejima and colleagues in NICMA uh, reconstructed um, by electron tomography uh, this structure that shows the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum in yellow, the T-tubule in green, mitochondria in, um, in pink, and then you also see the sarcomeres. The scale of this um, is sort of two microns cubed. Um, and we were able to use that uh, to reconstruct a three-dimensional model, put in functionally the receptors, particularly the ranidine receptors, the buffers, ion channels, um, and in a three-dimensional model shown here a high-quality three-dimensional finite element model, simulate a calcium spark and gain insights um, into important biological questions about their mechanisms. Um, in the interest of time, I won't show you other um, problems where we've done the same kind of thing, but at least one example is um, uh, where we've gone to the, to the um, scale of multiple T-tubuli along the cell, um, so we're approaching the scale of the whole cell. The second type of example or paradigm I want to show you is the use of uh, Markov models um, to bridge from molecular models to network models in the cell. And in this particular example, we're interested in the activation of the cyclic AMP activated protein kinase, um, which is a uh, tetramer consisting of two uh, regulatory R subunits and two um, catalytic C subunits. And the, the, look, the compartmentation and specificity of PKA signaling, which is very important in cardiac myocytes, is 
uh, mediated in part by A-kinase anchoring proteins that anchor different isoforms of the tetramer, di different uh, uh, tetramers to different parts of the cell. For example, PKA2 is mostly found in the cleft that I just showed you. The cytosol tends to have PKA1, mitochondria PKA1. And um, the different holoenzymes, as you can see here, have different tetrameric structures. For example, R1-alpha, you see, brings the two catalytic subunits here close together, and that facilitates um, cooperative interactions between those RC heterodimers, whereas the R1-beta tetramer here, you see the um, catalytic subunits are at the end of this more elongated holoenzyme, and that tends to limit the potential for um, cooperative in, uh, interactions between the C subunits. And so we're able to sort of reflect these differences in the structure of Markov models. These are thermodynamic models, not kinetic models, of these different uh, PKA isoforms. And We've used biochemical experiments, many of them done in Susan Taylor's lab, to uh, parameterize uh, these Markov models. Um, but we are now working with Romeo Morrow and Andy McCammon's group and Susan to, um, to drill deeper because, for example, the free R1-alpha here actually exists in two conformations. These states are ensembles of different protein conformations. as an H and a B conformation. And then using molecular dynamics, we can actually sample these spaces and find the probability of the free R1-alpha existing in these two states then uh, use um, Brownian dynamics to calculate the um, uh, uh, affinities for cyclic AMP and C, then put those parameters back into the models, compute the differential, uh, in this case, steady state activation curves, and then put them into whole cell models with different uh, curves uh, corresponding to different compartments. How do we validate models like these? Well, one valuable way has been to use um, live cell imaging uh, techniques. For example, this is a FRET study in cardiac myocytes transfected with a, a FRET sensor of protein kinase A activity developed by Roger Chen's lab called ACAR. And um, uh, as you'll hear from uh, Les Lowe later on, we were then able to use his code, uh, program virtual cell, in order to simulate that experiment and understand. Um, scaling up, we can, um, we can use these models to examine uh, defects at the whole uh, tissue and organ scale. This is a tissue model of an arrhythmia that's associated with a defect in signaling um, uh, and a defect in the ACAP. And um, the result of that model was an unusual um, electrocardiogram, this very bizarre electrocardiogram, which had never been reported at the time that we did the simulation. The following year, there was a first clinical report of this particular arrhythmia phenotype in a genetic, human genetic disease. Here we have another example where we've gone, instead of doing electrophysiology and signaling, we've gone from the molecular behavior of, um, in this case, um, the uh, regulatory light chain of uh, myosin all the way through to the dynamics of the intact heart. I don't have time to explain. And yet another one where we're now starting working with Andy's group to go from molecular dynamics to whole organ scales using mut mut mutations of troponin C um, as, as our uh, model system for which we also have uh, animal models. My last couple of slides, I just wanted to say a couple of things about software engineering and training. Um, we've developed some, uh, in our modeling uh, software development, we've developed some philosophies. Um, they're not necessarily general philosophies, but they've been useful for us. One philosophy is that we want everything that we would consider, that one would consider to be the theoretical mathematical model to be data, not code. And that's actually quite hard because most of the things that are model are equations which lend themselves to being encoded in code. So what we've done is developed symbolic model editors and domain-specific uh, mathematical languages, then implemented automatic code generation and just-in-time compilation so that ultimately everything, including the governing partial differential equations, will just be an input to our code. Um, the other aspect of this is we want these models to be shareable and reusable, and so uh, our software has a library, that a database in which these models, with all the things that define those models, um, including the equations and the parameters and the geometries, can be deposited, searched, shared or not. And then lastly, I made it to the last slide, I wanted to m have one comment about uh, graduate training. Um, I've been uh, very fortunate to direct an uh, interdisciplinary program here at UCSD called the Interfaces Graduate Training Program that involves eight different uh, graduate programs from um, four divisions on campus. Um, Drs. Taylor, uh, Ellisman, and Sanowski are co-directors. 
Our curriculum consists of seven laboratory courses that are all involve technologies that span scales, uh, uh, different technology scales from mass spectrometry all the way to whole body magnetic resonance imaging. But do you want to know which of these seven courses is the most popular with our students? This one, Numerical Analysis for Multiscale Biology. This program, which is very challenging, is attracting the very best students, and they want, from all different disciplines, and they want not only to have the tools to make measurements of structure and function at these widely varying scales, but they also want to be able to develop numerical models of these processes to aid in their understanding. So graduate training here is not a challenge, it's not a problem, it's a huge opportunity to attract the best students. Thank you very much.